lectures, you, you gain the right of passage in one of the long-standing tragedies at the universities across the world. Please share your knowledge and showcase your work with pride and with distinction. Family, uh, with distinction, you are now officially introduced to the wider public and to your friends and family and colleagues as a professor and to publicize your academic achievements and to in fact demonstrate what has happened with you, with you in this regard. Now let me call upon the Dean of the Faculty of Military Science to come and introduce, uh, welcome you all to this uh, auspicious occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Program Director, Dr. Manama, colleagues, faculty staff, all the support staff around student body themselves, our colleagues from Stellenbosch, family members of our two colleagues, Professor McKinty and Professor Van Dijk. I'm simply here to welcome every one of you that is present here. And before I do that, let me recognize the presence of my boss. And I always say I pride myself with so many bosses that I have in the world. And uh, one of them is Professor Klute. Thank you very much for supporting us in this endeavor. And uh, the Chief of Staff is also present on behalf of the Commandant, uh, uh, Colonel uh, Dlamini. And on that note, uh, I'm not going to take the limelight because the two brothers are here to be the ones that are going to talk. And I think on that note, uh, we, we, we also congratulate them uh, in, in their achievement. And this is part of lifetime achievement in their academic field. And on that note, let me say welcome to the Military Academy. Welcome on behalf of the Commandant and on behalf of the Dean of the Faculty of Military Science. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my job has been made much more simpler now. Uh, I just have to talk, and the rest of the colleagues have to talk, and the rest have to listen. I'm talking about the professors have to talk, and the rest of you have to listen. Uh, listen carefully. Right. Let me introduce Professor McGinde. Professor McGinde, what is it about mathematics that we need to be excited about? In, this is one of the disciplines that is critical in every sphere of our lives. Please come to the stage and share your thoughts. But first, people must know where you come from. Professor McGinde uh, is a professor of mathematics and computation and, and of applied and computational mathematics in the Faculty of Military Science, Lampus University. He is also a visiting professor of applied and computational mathematics to several other universities, including Velore University of, of Technology in India, the Nelson Mandela African Institute of Science and Technology in Tanzania, and the Pan-African University Institute for Basic Sciences, Technology and Innovation in Kenya, the African University of Science and Technology in Nigeria, the Adama Science Technology and Technology University in Ethiopia. He obtained his BSc, uh, first class honors and MSc degrees in mathematics from the University of, of Ife, now Obafeni Awolowo War in, Niger in Nigeria. His PhD uh, is in applied mathematics and computations, which was obtained under the prestigious Commonwealth Scholarship at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. Professor McGinder has already worked as a senior professor and director of postgraduate studies and a co-founding director of the Institute of Advanced Research in Mathematics Modeling and Computations at the Cape, uh, Cape Peninsula University of Technology. And also he was a, a full professor uh, at the University of the North. And Professor Makinde is the recipient of the 2014 Nigerian National Honor Award titled the Member of the Order of the Federal Republic for his outstanding contribution to mathematical sciences uh, and technology. Uh, in Africa by His Excellency, the President of Nigeria. 
He is the winner of the prestigious 2011-2012 African Union Kwame Nkrumah Continental Scientific Award from African Heads of State for outstanding contribution to basic science, technology, and innovation in Africa. He is also the winner of the South African National Science and Technology Forum and National Research uh, Foundation, NRF 2009 and 2010. Professor McKinde is also a winner of the Research Scientist Award at the Faculty of Military Science, Stellenbosch University for 2016-2017. And he has been named a prestigious fellow of the African Academy of Sciences for outstanding contributions to science, innovation, and technology in Africa. Professor Wende is on the editorial board of several reputable academic journals, uh, such as the Journal of Applied Mathematics, Africa Mathematica, the Journal of Nanofluids, the Journal of Nigerian Mathematical Society, the Open Chemical Engineering, a journal and PLOS One, and also served as a reviewer for many reputable international academic journals uh, worldwide and for the NRF. Professor McKinley has also edited two research books on nonlinear heat transfer in solids and fluids, uh, titled Diffusion Foundations, Volume 11, and Defect and Diffusion uh, Forum, Volume 377, published by the Transtech uh, Publications. He authored four applied mathematics uh, textbooks and monographs and published over 300 research papers, uh, research papers in many reputable international uh, journals. Now let's uh, uh, raise our hands and please applaud Professor Maginde and please come to the stage uh, that way. Let me, I will start by thanking the program director for the excellent invitation and welcoming me to the stage. Um, I think all the protocol I observed already, and I don't need to repeat all the protocol. They are already there, the vice chancellor, the deputy vice chancellor, registrar, the GOC training command, the commandant, uh, military academy, the deans, and other deans, all the protocol observed. And uh, um, the, 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 as you, I mean, I'm here to present the inaugural lecture, and I think um, it's necessary for me to, to, to go through what you already have in the, in the book you have there. Mr. Vice Chancellor, permit me to appreciate the Almighty God in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ for the rare opportunity and uncommon privilege it bestowed upon me to be here today. To God be the glory and adoration. It gives me great pleasure to stand before you today to present my an inaugural lecture for this great university. This will be the third university professorial inaugural lecture in my academic that I deliver in my academic career. I became a full professor in 1998, as you have been uh, told through the moderator and delivered my first inaugural lecture in 2004 at the University of Lipopo, former University of the North, as shown in the picture there. Um, the second similar address was at the Cape Peninsula University in 2010 as a senior professor and chair of postgraduate studies after receiving the NRF and NSTF T.W. Kambule Award for a study contribution to research and uh, capacity building in South Africa. That's shown in that figure. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, mathematics, the language of science, has two dialects. dialects. Pure mathematics and applied mathematics. Both kinds of mathematics can be utilized to solve problems. Why pure mathematics focuses on abstract concepts? Applied mathematics deals with the analysis of real life problems. Based on discovered fundamental laws in science, with valid empirical evidence, such as the conservation law, the law of gravitation, relativity, law of classical mechanics, ETC. Although the required mathematical skill and rigor needed to achieve excellent career success in either pure or applied mathematics discipline may be slightly different, the outcome with respect to global scientific impact 
at the same. This lecture is titled Applied Mathematics Makes Innovation Feasible. The title was chosen for the following reasons. One, to enlighten the public on the indispensable role played by applied mathematics in terms of achieving innovation and advancement in science, engineering, and technology. To, to demonstrate the significance of mathematical modeling and computation in scientific research. And to highlight some of my contributions so far in the field of applied mathematics. What is applied mathematics? Applied mathematics can be described as the art of problem solving through logical reasoning. It deals with the creation and study of mathematical and computational tools that will solve challenging and complex problems in science and engineering, business, industry, and all aspects of human endeavor. As you have seen the program, I mean, this diagram you have there, you can see applied mathematics form the nucleus of all the disciplines. You cannot achieve excellent innovation without making use of applied mathematics in form of statistics or in form of computation one way or the other. Applied mathematics research focus, focuses on the formulation and study of mathematical models, which are crucial tools for innovation and advancement in science, engineering, and technology. Behind each major technological advancement, you can list all of them, landing on the moon, inv inv inventing of television, fax machine, all kinds of things. There is mathematical technology and mathematical brain behind it. The need for applied mathematics is necessary in all walks of life, whether engineers, scientists, or those working in the world of industry, finance, government, and social sciences. Remark, important remark, religious or spiritual problems cannot be effectively tackled by applied mathematics because logical reasoning really has no part to play in that discipline. So that you can't apply mathematics to solve, but you can solve other problems. But for individual problem, apply mathematics has no place there. What is innovation? In the context of science, engineering, and technology, innovation refers to new ideas that comes from solution to complex real-life problems produced by applied mathematics. Why innovation products are the engineering and technological devices materials and services generated based on this solution that are made available to market, to government, and society at large. This simply implies the outcome of applied mathematics research is tantamount to innovation. When you do apply mathematics, what you are doing eventually is that you are making innovation. The innovative ideas of applied mathematicians, such as Hion from Alessandra, which is in Egypt, Isaac Newton from England, James Clark Maxwell from Scotland, Albert Einstein from, from uh, Germany, and many others have led to the development of several technologies and high-quality innovative products that we are enjoying today. Remark, in Africa, there seems to be a very serious misconception regarding the real meaning of innovation. Innova innovation products are erroneously called innovation highly celebrated and acknowledged. Why apply mathematics research that produces the innovation that is new idea, both basic and incremental, never receive adequate recognition support it or, and support it deserves due to the theoretical nature of the discipline? Consequently, the discipline becomes less attractive to African scholars. This invariably leads to lack of much needed innovation, innovative ideas, and poor quality of innovation, innovative products on the continent, thereby making the continent a regular consumer of quality innovation products from other continents, where the discipline of applied mathematics and research receives adequate recognition and support for their, for, for their scholars. Therefore, this is my recommendation. It is imperative for all stakeholders to put applied mathematics discipline and research on sad footing in order to prepare our continent for a dynamic and technological advanced economy in this 21st century. My research objective. The main objective of my research is to use mathematical theories and methodology to gain insight into the complex dynamics of various engineering and biological systems that are of industrial, environmental, and medical and social interest. 
You can see some of the applied theoretical uh, uh, the, those pictures I put here. Now, you, 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 I go to my research focus. My research focus in the field of applied mathematics can be subdivided into three categories. One, computer mathematics. Two, techno mathematics. Three, mathematical biology. What is computer mathematics? This deals with the creation of mathematical and computer tools to tackle applied mathematics problem or the real life problem. My main focus area, my main research focus area in this field include multivariate series summation and improvement techniques, algebraic and differential approximation techniques, and my party approximation, function approximation, deciding singularity in nonlinear problems. Other focus areas are improved numerical and semi numerical methods, such as finite difference methods, spectral method, financial association method, and domain decomposition, homotopy analysis method, homotopy parameter method, and so on and so forth. Those are those areas I focus on for the file for almost 30 or 35 years now. And I have supervised several students at BSc honors, MSc, PhD, and postdoctoral level, and published several research papers in this field, in reputable journals. Just put that to show you some of the computational aspects we do. Now, the following section illustrates one of the illustrative, I mean, innovative computational techniques based on the outcome of my research in this field. I will not bother you much, but I'll just mention a few things. For those who have idea of mathematics, when you give a student a function, find the Taylor series, they can find the partial sum and do it quickly. But giving the partial sum, can you, can you get the function back? If you are giving the partial sum of the function, you don't know the function. Can you reconstruct the function back? That is one of the first breakthrough research I made. And I was able to write a program, generate a program, and develop a method that you can generate from partial sum, you can get back the, 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 the function that represents that partial sum. And that involves a lot of computation, which is one of the innovative uh, idea. I will not talk much on that. There are papers that state that, and this deals with the issue of multivariate series analysis called special form of amide per approximant, where you have algebraic and special approximant. I won't talk much on that because I know uh, most people may not be mathematically inclined, but at the same time, the, just to have the rough idea of what is going on. Now, these are just the service singularities and all those things, but the remark of that innovative result is this. The above innovative computational method developed by me has generated a new approach of accurately tackling complex nonlinear systems that model real life problems in science, engineering, and technology. It also provides a new function approximation techniques and nonlinear dynamic singular, singularity deciding method. So that is what those methods is, and it's highly, highly acclaimed in, that, in the field of applied mathematics. This just shows a flow chart of how the completion, the computational method works. I just put a flow chart there, and it's in the booklet there. Two, the second aspect of my work deals with technomathematics. Technomathematics deals with the application of computational mathematics and mathematical models to tackle engineering, industrial, and technological problems. My research focus in this area include computational fluid mechanics, MHD we call magnetohydrodynamics, hydromag I mean hydrodynamic stability, thermodynamics, combustion theory, dynamical system, and nanofluid dynamics. I have supervised several MSc, BSc, PhD, postdoctoral students in that area and published several research articles in that area. You can check the appendix of what the booklet you have and also you see a list of papers and also in the references to portray the point. I illustrate below one of my research outcome on nanotechnology related internal and external flow problem. This number, the first one there is nano fluid flow in micro channel with heat transfer. Micro channel is used to enhance heat transfer and to reduce heat in any electronics devices. So I will use nano fluid also combined with it. It makes the rate of cooling. 
to be enhanced. Research was done on this, and the application of the result we get in mathematical time is this, but in terms of interpretation, it, the, the research, it assists in cooling electronic devices and the automobile. Even when you put your coolant in radiator, you have radiator, you put coolant. The coolant you are putting, that liquid you are putting is a nano liquid, which you are putting to enhance the cooling of your engine. The other internal flow there is talk about ferro, uh, ferro fluid stagnation point flow, which is an external flow. This work is extremely important and also a lot of commission involved, and it has a lot of application in surface cooling. When you have metal or the roofing sheet, you want to shape them well and cool them to form certain shape, you use this kind of model and the kind of result are used for this. It's called banding layer flow problem, which ferro fluid means fluid that are susceptible to magnetic field. And we have, have done that, and it's highly acclaimed, and a lot of stability work are doing, and the work was very, very uh, important in the industry. And if you check some of the journals, and uh, you see some of the citations on this type of, on this work. I just show it as an example. What of military? In military, we have technomathematics we apply in military. In fact, the work, if you look at the work in, in, in form of dynamical system, you look at the work of Lancaster. Lancaster developed a kind of model which you look at is a dynamical system which you can use to tackle why P and Q can be two forces fighting against each other. This is a pretty combat model. And you can analyze it to know, to answer various questions. Who will win? Is it P that will win the battle? What are the forces of P that you need for, to defeat Q? What are the attrition rates? A1, A2, I mean A1, B1, A2, B2, the attrition rate of both P and Q respectively. So this is called Lancaster model. You check, there are a lot of work done. This one is a modified form. And the analysis of it will give you how to do a kind of field, uh, area fire point when you want to do area fire, which is the, what is happening here, the kind of area fire, or you want to do it in, in form of a uh, target uh, fire point where you have all, you are, you are, you are, you are targeting the enemy, and you, are, and, you are, and you are hitting the point. So this model is extremely important. It's used in UK, and they were able to conquer the world with the World War One and two and so on. So it's very important. Remark, Lancaster equations are taught and used at every major military college in the world. If you check all military college, they taught this course, and they, uh, it's for mathematics, a lot of dynamical system to, 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 to be able to appreciate that. Now, let's go to mathematical biology. This not part of my research focus. This deals with the application of mathematical model and computation to tackle biological, ecological, epidemiological, and medical problems. My research focus personally in this area include model analysis and cost-effective optimal control of human, animal, and plant diseases, as well as the ecological problem, such as you have malaria and so on. In fact, I put, if you look at this, the issue of climatic change, when you there are seasons for fruit, there are seasons for tree leaf, they, 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 the leaf will be disappearing. And those ones are due to climate, to temperature and weather system. You can model it, which we have done, and be able to gather. Here you can see the migration of the animals. During season, they move from one place to another. I just showed it to earlier. And here you have the issue of prey, predator issue. This is a predator, uh, it's a lion, it's a prey. So we can look at the dynamics in the in, in form of a park. Like we have game park, you want to have sustainable ecosystem in the game park. We can model that. These are plant disease, rotten tomato or fruit and so on. Then you want to look at what causes it. How can we control it? It's a lot of dynamical system involved. And you see on my paper, this is a food web. Food web, you have the plant, you have the, the primary producer, you have the, uh, uh, the consumer. Secondary consumer, you can have uh, issues of uh, animals. Animals can be herbivores that eat plant or carnivores or hominivores that eat both of them. You can look at the dynamics to maintain stability. You need to look at what is the equilibrium. All these things are part of the work we do, medical biology. Now, I put even childhood disease, misu, to show you an example. When children are born, they are immunized. They want to look. You, suppose some children are not immunized. There is outbreak of misu. What can you do to control? Do you need to fascinate all the children? No. But you need to know the percentage you can facilitate to make sure that the seeds go down. Yes, there are a lot of things you need to do, but you can't, you don't, because God may not have money to fascinate all the children. 
to cure that misuse. But you can know the percentage. We're able to calculate it by looking at the reproductive number as well as the uh, critical fascination proportion of the population you need to fascinate to get the disease go down. So these are some of the things. Uh, there are a lot of work done there. My research network. Over the years, my research network and collaboration have extended globally to include many other established researchers in countries such as we are in South Africa, uh, uh, we have Ethiopia, Namibia, Botswana, India, Ghana, uh, uh, we have Algeria, USA, Britain, Nigeria, Papua New Guinea, Tanzania, Kenya, Pakistan, Australia, Saudi Arabia. People do ask, how do you make it, you are, you are isolated and you are publishing many papers. The issue is network. This network also involves some of my former postgraduate students who, are, who have also become established researchers in the field. So there are networks with all my students, and I do the work. When you don't get support, you have to be innovative in your research. Because if I say one of the isolated researchers in this country who has made it out of isolation, I can say I'm one of them. But thank God, here am I with all this. So you can make it. You can make it. You don't need to depend on any collaboration. But you need it. You want collaboration, it will, you will, it will sell you. But without it, you don't need to get down that I'm the only one. Nobody is supporting. You can still move forward by research network. Then, what is my, con uh, my contribution so far to apply mathematics and achievement? Journal publication. If you check, as I've been told, I've published over 300 articles in journals. My H index is 46. I10 index is 198. Citation index, 8,591, and so on and so forth. You can check on this Google Scholar. You can also check on Scopus and Web of Science scientific metrics that measure the quality and what you are doing. Now, book editor. I've edited several books, as written there, I've done it for not to waste time. What of issue of postgraduate candidate supervise? I've supervised 30 PhD. I list them. If you check the book, the booklet you have, you have a list of them. And the day they graduated. I've supervised over 30 PhD, 70 mass MSc, and over 200 BSc honor candidates across African countries. I put the country where those students come from. I wrote it there so that one can see what is going on there. Now, the next thing that I need to emphasize, research award. You have been told from the, from the uh, brief citation you had. Uh, uh, in South Africa here, by special grace of God, I was able to get NSTF award. And I can, I can mention also at Limpopo, 1999 to 2007, I received the best senior researcher award for every year throughout 1999 to 2007. Being dead on farming and a full professor that time. I moved to CPUT, I continue receiving it at CPUT. For the year, I put it there also for CPUT the same, for here also the same thing. 2016, 2017, I got it also. So it's something that has been, a, a, it's not something that just started yesterday. I received Fellow of African Academy of Sciences, Fellow of Papua New Guinea for what I contributed in the country when they invited me there, and Fellow of International Academy of Physical Sciences in 2018. And also, I, I received uh, the, 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 um, um, the, the, the book award that uh, my paper was the best uh, by, by International Journal of Miracle Method of Eat and Free Flow, which is in free make, it's my field. So twice, and I received a special honor from Nigerian government, the president of Nigeria invited me here to come there and they invited all over the country for uh, scientific contribution in, the, uh, in Africa. He, um, and, and they checked through the website and disease and by the grace of God I was choosing. Estana, then we have internal Estana award. I, I thank God that I was be able to, I'm able to receive the continental award from the all Africa of state. I tell you so, they invited me in 2012 and that seems to be by the special grace, I can say I am the only one in my field, mathematics, who has received this award of, because it's a lot, it's, it, it means a lot to the, to the AU that received that award in 2012, for 2000, which is African Kwamen Kruma Continental Award. Many Sadaka also have received a different field, but in mathematics, I can say I'm the only one who has received it in this continent of Africa. By the special grace of God, not by my power. Then, there are a lot of other awards you have seen there, fellow, and all those things. So these are the things. External examiner, I've served external examiner every time, journal editorship, review, and professional editor. I was the Secretary General of African Mathematical Union between 2009 to 2017, last year. 
of the whole Africa, and I was the secretary and vice president of Africa, of Southern Africa Mathematical Association between 2002 to 2006, and uh, also many other things have served in professional leadership in my field. These are some of the pictures. This first picture, just to confirm when I received national honor in Nigeria, this one is AU Summit for uh, Continental Scientific Award for Africa, which I received in 2012. This one you have here for uh, AAS, which is the uh, African Academy of Sciences, and uh, when they have their, their annual, I mean, the, the, the issue uh, they had there uh, for, the, for presenting the new, uh, in 2012, the new uh, fellows. This is me in between there. And here, this year, I was invited to India. I didn't, I don't know anybody in India, and they gave me fellow of International Academy of, uh, of uh, Physical Sciences. It was highly publicized in the whole country this year in April. And, uh, and so that is the, the thing I received there in India. Now, um, this is when they asked me to deliver a lecture in India. I delivered this lecture in India to the Indian community or the scientists there for the academy I was awarded. And these are, the, and these are some of my former students. At CPUT, these are PhD students I produced there at CPUT. One, two, three, four, five, six. They all graduated under my supervision at CPUT. And this one at Limpopo, they are some of them. Out of the 30 of PhD, these are five, six of them. In Limpopo, Teflop. This is me in between, and this one PhD is graduated under me. It's from Malawi. His, his name is Peter Mioni, Mioni. Most, all of, most of them are professors now. And I thank God that the dean of this faculty also my former student. <laughs> it makes me happy when I see things like that. For BSc, for MSc, for everything. Is my, yeah, I taught, I supervised at Limpopo when I was HOD. I was the full professor and so on. So I'm very happy. When I see my students that are doing very well, and they also establish the center in their own right. Because the dean is a professor, meaning that he's also an established center in his own right. And some of other, all my students. Final remark What equals 100% in life? How achieving 101? Here is a mathematical proof to give you. If you let the alphabet A to Z to be represented 1 to 26, then hard work will give you 98%. Knowledge will give you 96. Attitude will give you 101. I mean 100. Love of God will give you 101%. So what I want to say there is that why hard work and knowledge will get you close and attitude will get you there. It is the love of God in Christ Jesus that will put you over the, over the top. Finally, in conclusion, why many of my comment now, we refer to African mathematical scientists. I believe that they have relevance to other disadvantaged groups in the world as well. Let there be any misunderstanding. My interest is by no means in advancing, in advancement only of African mathematical scientists. Rather, it is seen that all of the historical disadvantaged group in the world receive a true equal chance of educational, professional, and personal fulfillment. History tell us that the tens, uh, for ten, tens of thousands of years, Africa was the center of mathematical history. From the civilization of southern, eastern, central, and west, western and northern Africa came contributions that will enrich both ancient and modern understanding of nature through the application of mathematics, mathematics and science. A 35,000-year-old fossil uh, baboon bone found in DRC, the Isha Gobo is covered with a series of notches and tally marks, which means, which makes it the oldest mathematical object in the world. The world, uh, and that from the world earliest number system. The bone is also a lunar phase counter, which suggests that African women were the first applied mathematician. And skipping the track record of menstrual circles requires a lunar calendar. So women are the first applied mathematician because they use lunar circle. A model of glider dated to the 4th and 3rd century BC was found in Egypt. The structure of the object was most definitely aerodynamic design. From the measurements used in the African forest kingdom and the mathematics used in building the great stone complex of Zimbabwe, to the ancient and technology 
central uh, uh, technology, central administration, and the great accuracy of the dimension of Egyptian pyramid. The achievement of ancient Africa still give rise to wonder. Despite all this achievement, the work of African mathematical scientists in today's modern world is not well acknowledged. However, I'm very optimistic that the nature of mathematical science and indeed applied mathematics in Africa is very bright and that the lost glory of the past will be restored. Meanwhile, African mathematical scientists need to be steadfast, assertive, and persistent and make their voice heard and their innovative work known to their continent and the rest of the world. I also argue that it is good for the world and for the Sabbatist group that we have African mathematical scientists. I think all of us here know that the struggle against inequality, discrimination in Africa, and indeed all over the world is far from over. For, from, for all the gains we have been made, there is much, much more to be done. Discrimination, xenophobia, and racist stereotyping have not ended. Even in the field of, in, even in the field of mathematics, and applied mathematics in particular, and in the academic circle in general. Rather, they continue in subtler and covert forms. One of the forms they take is the false and demeaning notion, not necessarily articulated out loud, loud that African mathematical scientists do not have what it takes to be recognized and acknowledged for excellence in their career, or that applied mathematic, applied, African applied mathematician highly rated research output are not satisfactory, even when the auto-documented scientific metrics, evidence of excellent achievement internationally is overwhelming. That is auto. You are not the one even doing it. It's auto. It's overwhelming. People will say your work does not make sense. Just as discrimination, xenophobia, and injustice platform in today's world, I think we need to take a more subtle view of what benefit the entire African community in total and combat discrimination, xenophobia, racism, and injustice in academic circle. In my view, every African who makes a successful career in mathematical science is contributing to the well-being of the community. Even if the person's work or innovative idea do not have any immediate observable impact or on the social problem of the ghetto, the barriers and reservation, the future technology they produce we surely do. There are many ways to make impact. There are many ways to make impact. Sooner or later, the message of a person, of a person's achievement, will get through to his or her community, and it will be a source of pride to the elders, and hope, and of hope, an opportunity to the youth. The youth, in particular, need to know. There is no field for close to them, and that they do not need to feel inferior to anyone. They need to feel that they can afford to dream, and that it is worth, it is worth striving to make their dreams a reality. Moreover, every, sources, every such success sends a message to the entire world, serving to break down the prejudice, spoken and unspoken, that says that Africa members lack the capability for this or for that profession. When we contribute to diminish those prejudices, we are benefiting not only the group to which we belong, but also the entire world itself. The challenges facing the world today, now an foreseeable future, are just too great for society to ignore or to undervalue the capability of the entire group within the population. We all know that if we want to have society worth living in and worth passing to our children and great and grandchildren, it will, be, it will be one in which we appreciate one another as human beings for our individual quality instead of peering through blunders of uh, racial and xenophobia and prejudice inherited from our colonial past. I will urge you not to be dissuaded or disheartened by those who will tell you that your work in mathematical sciences and related field is inferior and is relevant to the broader society, I mean to the broader social concern of your community. Such advice is off the mark. The word of God states in Romans 
8, 35, 37, says that who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, human conspiracy, famine, nakedness, or peril, or, or, or sword, xenophobia, or racism, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for, for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conqueror through Christ who loves us. For African students, who knows, who knows that their passionate interest is in applied mathematics, I urge you to follow that calling. Not only is it the most likely path to your fulfillment, it is also a way to benefit your people and your country. If you want to be sure that you are doing something for the community you come from, let yourself be seen. Go into the schools. They will welcome you with open arms. Talk to the learners. Tell them what you are doing and let them know that it is worth the effort and worth taking the risk to make a career in applied mathematics. Nothing teaches like example. You may not know until years later, if at all, whose life you have touched. Or whose life you have touched, whom you inspired. You can be sure, however, that every time you help young people recover, that the horizon open to them and wider than they are known. You are accomplishing, I mean, you have accomplished something for them, for your community, for yourself, and for the country. Finally, I thank you all for all your patience. I hope I did not baffle you with too much mathematics. Let me end my address with the word of God in the book of Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. Here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commandments. For this is the entire duty of man. For God will bring, to, for God will bring every work into judgment including every secret things, whether good or bad. Once again, I thank you. Uh, let's give him a round of applause again. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Makinde. And if some of us were wondering uh, what was exciting or what is exciting about applied mathematics, you have heard it all. It is applicable in a number of environments. It is a driver of innovation. It drives industry and the economy and it's also applicable in biological sciences in terms of the maintenance of the ecosystem. And it's also applicable in the military context, which is much more relevant to us in the Faculty of Military Science. You can calculate the odds about how you're going to win the war. I'm not sure how it worked out with the Germans, but uh, they were not very successful in both wars. And they are known to be very good in mathematics, this regard. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I had in the grapevine that uh, in applied mathematics, people in that field, you, if you give them just a bag of rice, rice, testic rice, they can tell you the number of grains in that bag by just looking at it. <laughs> uh, now I believe it's true. So, Professor McGinde, how about the lot of numbers? And the can you calculate the odds? <laughs> so maybe we can uh, help each other there and so on. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Now. Uh, colleagues, uh, let me now introduce uh, another uh, professor who's going to present this inaugural lecture. Uh, in this time, we have uh, Professor Hilly van Dijk. Now, the military community is keen to hear what the military psychology offers. What are the highlights to be recognized and celebrated? And why military psychology is so critical is so critical to the organizational well-being and to support the operational effectiveness of the military, especially in the military environment, which is very, very stressful. I hope your lecture will also include something about stress relief and free consultations and so on. Uh, let me at least provide the CV, uh, curriculum vitae of Professor Van Dijk. 
Professor Van Dijk uh, is a professor of military psychology at uh, Stellenbosch University. He is also an, a National Research Foundation rated researcher who has developed expertise as well as in-depth theory and knowledge in military psychology for the, for the past 20 years. During his national service, that meaning after he joined the military, then it was still called the South African Defense Force. Uh, the name changing in, in 1947. I just have to hold history there. Right. Uh, he did operational duty in the infantry for interesting sake. I mean, he's a military psychologist and he was in the, an infant here. What an explosive combination uh, in the Angolan Namibian War. After he had registered as a clinical psychologist, he was appointed as head of psychology department, Northwest Medical Command, and where he offered psychological services to soldiers and their families. His academic career started uh, in 1996 at the Faculty of Military Science. He was a functional in the development of modules such as military psychology, organizational psychology, military ethics and leadership at graduate level, at graduate level and military psychology and management of operational psychopathology at honors level. He was also the program coordinator for uh, human and, and organizational development offered at undergraduate level and uh, the honors program in industrial psychology, uh, military. He was a school chair for human and organizational development for several years and represented the faculty at the program advisory committee, famously known as PAC at Stellenbosch University. Right, uh, the academic bureaucracy as we understand it. Uh, and a member of the university, and he acted as a supervisor for masters and doctoral students, as well as an external examiner for several universities in South Africa. He developed military psychology in three parts. One, in-depth theory based on applied research in Africa. Two, more than 15 young researchers in military psychology for Africa. Three, a textbook titled Military Psychology for Africa to spread the coals of knowledge to establish military psychology at African universities and militaries. This book is also in progress for, or, of translation in Serbian and the Balkan countries, that is some of the Eastern European countries, in case you don't know. Yeah. He undertook several research projects with universities in Africa, such as Makerere University in Uganda, Yaounde uh, in Cameroon, uh, and presented more than 30 papers at national and international conferences, and published five books several chapters in books, and more than 34 uh, uh, accredited articles. So let's put our hands together and welcome Professor Khalif van Dijk to the stage. Some obstacle. I can use this one. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the kind words of welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to. Uh, people supporting me over the years. Before I Before I start with my inaugurational lecture Allow me some comments in a few words of appreciation. An inaugural lecture is a great privilege. The fact that it is taking place a month before I retire 
doesn't matter. It's still a personal milestone in my life. It is for me an opportunity not to boast, but rather to inform academics, officers, friends, and family of the status of military psychology in Africa and its development, successes, and challenges for the future. I will be a disciple of military psychology until I die because it makes a constructive contribution to the lives of soldiers and their families to protect our country and continent for peace for all of us. My appreciation for support and opportunities goes to the SNDF, Salambos University, and specifically my Dean, Professor Sletla, also Professor Johan Malan, my academic mentor, for the research opportunity allowed as Chair of the Department of Industrial Psychology at the main campus. I also wish to thank my colleagues and specific my academic assistants over the years, specifically Gomozo Majeke and Tuli Makatini. I appreciate your support from the depth of my heart. Ina Butters for your support, hard work and patience. I really thank you. A special word of appreciation to my parents as role models of grit, hard work, and good values. To my son, Gideon and Elian, who make their time available for me, thank you for your love and support. To my creator, thank you for giving me, granting me opportunities and good health. The topic for tonight on my side, ladies and gentlemen, military psychology contributions and challenges in the 21st century in Africa. I will start with the introduction and with some historical background. There are significant differences between the various military services where each service has a distinctive culture and traditions. However, there are also a number of common elements and similarities. Similarly, there are many, many different fields within psychology registered at the HPCSA, such as clinical, counseling, educational, industrial, and research psychology. Military psychology as a subject is an intersection of these different fields in psychology. In this regard, military psychology as a subject is only available at graduate and postgraduate level at our Faculty of Military Science, Stellenbosch University in South Africa. In Africa, it is available at only a few universities such as in Namibia, Egypt, and Nigeria. With the entry of the United States of America into World War I in 1917, a committee of psychologists under the president of the American Psychological Association, Dr. Robert Jerks, offered assistance to the U.S. Army. This led to the establishment of the Division of Psychology in the Office of the Surgeon General of the U.S. Army. Overall, the work of Dr. Jerks and his colleagues during World War I represented the birth of military psychology. Most military psychology applications begin, ladies and gentlemen, with a military requirement or a military need. Screening, selection, classification, and placing recruits were among the earliest concerns of the military. Even in the Bible book, Judges, the selection of soldiers fit for combat was described. In World War I, the following important effective selection was a requirement with the use of the alpha and the beta tests for intelligence, occupational classification, aptitudes, and special force screening. I'm under the impression the first psychometric tests ever. During World War II, the focus in requirements for military psychology changed to aspects such as the following. A great 
need to deal with combat reactions and psychiatric casualties. A focus on the needs of military families, the development of mental health clinics and outpatient facilities, programs developed for alcohol and drug abuse, smoking cessation, morale team building, and suicide prevention. Military psychology experienced a slow start in South Africa with an explosion during the Namibian and Gola War. During this period, considerable work was done on the selection of careers such as pilots, divers, and the special force operators. In addition, much psychological support at the military hospitals was presented to casualties from the war with injuries and psychological conditions such as PTSD, anxiety, depression, and episodes of schizophrenia. Late in the 1990s, the approach changed to decentralized psychology services to the different commands, for example, Polakwani, Pochestrom, Uppington, and Kimberley. In this regard, the subject also made a meaningful contribution in the classroom at the Faculty of Military Science at Saldana on graduate and postgraduate level. During 96, when I started at the faculty, coming through infantry training, be a platoon commander during the border war, finish my master's in clinical psychology, working in Pochestrom with the challenges of soldiers and their families, I changed the curriculum to a requirement approach to apply military psychology in the lives and workplace of our members. In broader Africa, there is a great need and a gold mine opportunity to get involved in military psychology challenges. We are in the process of settling military psychology at universities in Namibia, Uganda, and Nigeria. Best of defined military psychology, the application of research technology, principles, and methods of psychology within the military environment in order to address challenges which leads to improved capability of own forces and countering the potential diminishing effect the opposing forces activities might have on our own forces. And this is the definition in the 21st century for research in our subject. I want to focus now, ladies and gentlemen, on the contributions of military psychology, the development, research, and contributions during the past 15 years. The military is a challenging career characterized by trauma, risks, conflicting emotions, high demand on soldiers under fire, and complications to make proper decisions without sometimes the necessary knowledge. For some soldiers in adventure, and for others as disaster. Kozar from Canada writes, accepting the role as a combat soldier in war is a risk with life, limp, and mind. Soldiers may be making sacrifices that may result in death, physical injury, and or apintations, or the collapse of mental health with conditions such as anxiety, depression, stress, and PTSD. The presentation aims to illustrate the more relevant developments in military psychology at the Faculty of Military Science, with a focus area approach to satisfy the requirement principle for the SNDF. Warwick postulates that conventional operations are probable in Africa. In this regard, the SNDF also focus its training on conventional warfare, although focus on peacekeeping operations is a high or even a very high priority. The SNDF has contributed meaningfully to peacekeeping operations in countries such as Sudan, Central Republic of Africa, the DRC, to mention a few. In this regard, Brouwer and Van Dijk conducted research in 2003 on the South African peacekeeping experience with the sample SNF soldiers in their first and fifth rotation visits to the DRC. 
Brouvert also adapted the stress model of Lamison and Callaway to the model of peacekeeping stress for Africa as part of a theoretical framework of a study. The model of Lamison and Callaway explains that exposure to combat stresses may result in traumatic stress. However, here the process of stress appraisal plays a role with the interplay between these demands of the environment and the resources of the soldier. Any imbalance between the two creates more stress. In this model, work group cohesion is also a buffer that affects the relationship between exposure to the stresses and the experience of stress. Lastly, the model proposed physiological, emotional and behavioral strain as possible outcomes of peacekeeping stress on soldiers with consequences for the SNDF. Another focus area that required attention was debriefing of trauma. In 1989, when I joined the military in Pochestero Medical Command, our last forces had withdrawn from the Namibia and Gola War from Walfus Bay. After I counseled soldiers on how to process and deal with trauma, I became aware of the effect of trauma on soldiers, their families, and the relationships with children and in their marriages. I need to mention, ladies and gentlemen, I was very involved in my work and wrote an article in the Herald in Potchefstroom on the Wehetan syndrome with our members and been reprimanded by the director of psychology because the intelligence community tried to prevent to mention it that this thing is also on the table in South Africa. I realized then that there was a need to manage trauma properly before, during, and after operations. The work of Derek Groff from Norway became very relevant, but I needed to develop a psychological debriefing model specifically for Africa. After 94, being part of a team of psychologists and social workers from the former SADF, XMK, and APLA to develop the psychological integration program, I anticipated that in order to develop a successful model for Africa, it was necessary to accommodate cultural diversity. The psychological debriefing model for Africa consists of the, of, out of three phases, what I developed at the end of the day for our members in the Defence Force. We started with the cognitive phase. In African culture, it is well known that soldiers want to tell their story, the story of the, uh, the traumatic incident and what they heard, saw, smelled and experienced. It is more comfortable for soldiers to start on a factual base, using this phase to start to relax, form good cohesion and share parts of the same story and develop at the end of the day a weakness. It helps them to feel safe and to move to the emotional phase. The effective phase, this is where the debriefing process goes to a deeper emotional level where the soldiers can share their fears, survivors guilt, anger, hate, pain, anxiety. In other words, to finish the unfinished. Splitting of the ego in dissociation through the re-experience of an app reaction in a safe environment. The focus is to prevent conditions such as PTSD and to keep our members, ladies and gentlemen, combat ready. Being sensitive to cultural diversity, soldiers can dance around a fire, clap their hands and singing songs with a burning platform or a dancing mandala to heal them from unfinished business. The last one is the empowerment phase, is the phase to activate the ego empowerment and ego functioning to deal with the challenges in the future, specifically to activate them out of a mindset of hopelessness. The model was adapted in 2016 to a more holistic approach, discussion to follow later. The next theme required attention 
of militaries in Africa, and I'm under the impression, ladies and gentlemen, all over the world is military leadership. In most countries, for example, the United States of America, Germany, and the UK, militaries commenced by using leadership models, theories, and training models normally applied with great success by private companies. The question is, can the military just do this? The answer is no. From the research of Batone, it is clear that the organizational culture of the military differentiates strongly with the private companies. The military is not a money-making business. The military organizational culture involves a life in this situation. The success is not assessed through marketing and profit, but either to defend our constitutions, the borders of our country, or the peace on our continent. Secondly, important for us, military leaders of the SNDF need to be competent in a variety of leader positions. From a national commander to peacekeeping operation commander on an international level, meaning a single leadership model will not satisfy the challenges of the diversity of leadership positions. In this regard, we decided to develop a process approach to leadership development at the Faculty of Military Science. The process exists of the following phases, and I will mention it cryptically. Phase one, to become a self-leader at a junior level based on the theory of super leadership, apply in the military, apply in the military to develop more independent and self-critical leaders with self-set goals for the future. Phase two, to focus on transformational leader skills to be military leaders that develop inner strength in subordinates, which I totally support in a great need in our organization. Phase three, operational leadership or leadership under fire is to develop soldiers' willingness to obey the military leader in high-risk operations. That brings trust into play between the military leader and his followers under fire, meaning to affect a soldier's willingness to accept a leader's influence in dangerous and high-risk settings. This demand mateship between soldier based on trust and high level of competency and self-efficacy in the leader as experienced by his followers. Leadership under fire is not in an air-conditioned office, but in life and death situations as described by Lieutenant General Ndiwe Yam as blood and dust and diesel. Phase four, strategic leadership, the process of the controversial arms deal in 94 and 95 involves strategic ability and leadership. It demands knowledge of, as example, military and political and region traits and to see what other people cannot see in a situation. There is a story. Sol Kirsner flew with his pilot and his small airplane over Pilansberg and saw the future Sun City with his eyes and mind and gave an instruction to develop it. The parade ground culture where only the commander decided to move only left, give the command, and without thinking the rest follows, can put a ceiling on the strategic ability of our future military leaders. After the first in the United States in Iraq, retired General Flowers was tasked to assess the performance of the Americans in the desert. He concluded that strategic ability is demanded on the lowest level on the ground in wars. Vogelaar explained, on seeing commanders, like in peacekeeping operations at roadblocks and in near wars in Africa, have to make sense of the political, military, cultural challenges on the ground in order to make proper and ethical strategic decisions with loaded implications for the future in Africa. Dean, this dimension 
requires imperative attention in this faculty. Leadership success for the 21st century put new demands on the table. In this regard, Grinling did excellent research in Africa. Leadership success refers to leaders being good motivators during operations, who have competent interpersonal skills to reach own soldiers and the population in Africa on peacekeeping missions, and reproduces satisfaction with work uh, processes to his members. The results as indicated in figure two indicated emotional intelligence as a strong predictor of leadership success. Secondly, the results indicated psychological capital as indicated in figure three uh, as an predictor of leader success in future operations in Africa. The important, this is important since leadership serves as a buffer to protect combat readiness and mental health of soldiers and well a multiplier of force for our forces. Results from the research of Van Dijk with a sample of junior officers from the South African Military Academy showed strong traits of narcissistic personality disorder. These results an indication that the SNDF needs to give attention to selection, training, and education of, of officers with more focus on emotional intelligence and psychological capital since narcissistic traits do not support good relationships. A supporting atmosphere to soldiers or contribute to peace negotiations in Africa peace missions. This is an important piece of uh, research what is very relevant for selection, training, education, and development of future leaders. The next contribution of military families to sustain combat readiness and mental health of soldiers and their families became imperative for us in the faculty when the SNF decided soldiers will not deploy for six months anymore, but for 12, like for missions, in the DRC. In this regard, Shinga and Van Dijk had accomplished meaningful research with an SNDF sample at the Brug in Bloemfontein before they withdrew for peacekeeping operation deployment in Sudan. They used the theoretical conceptual framework of Kirkland and Katz on the influence of the soldier's relationship with his or her unit, his or her family, on combat readiness with hardiness as an example. The results are illust uh, illustrated there in figure four. The results showed that hardiness does not have an influence on the relationship between the soldier and his or her spouse, but measurements indicated that the relationships with other constructs had been influenced. This is important results for SNDF commanders. They need to manage soldiers properly to spend time in their units and with their families. Plus, through military psychologists develop the hardiness of soldiers before deploying on operations in order to sustain their combat readiness and mental health. A, mental, a mentionable percentage of SNDF soldiers are single parents. We can see the SNDF is a micro community from the broader population. Ladies and gentlemen, out of 18 million children in South Africa, 12 million are raised in single parent homes with the majority being with a mother. Furthermore, the majority of single parents are African females. Majeki and Van Dijk conducted a research project on single parents, a challenge for militaries, with a sample from the SNDF. At the International Military Testing Association, IMTA conference last year in Bern, Switzerland, there was a great interest of the attendees on our presentation, single parents in militaries, and I became aware of the great need at the end of the day in militaries all over the world. Majeki developed a conceptual framework for research to assess the influence of stress, 
social support, work-family conflict, and work-family enrichment on the work satisfaction of single parents in the SNF. There is, an, is the figure to illustrate at the end of the day the negative contribution of stress to work satisfaction as well as a negative contribution from work-family conflict and then positive from social support and work-family enrichment. Social support of single parents will empower their work-family enrichment if the SNDF supports work-family enrichment through programs by military psychologists, it will have a constructive positive effect on the stress levels, work-family conflict of single parents, as well as contribute to higher levels of work satisfaction. Meaning during operations, work-family enrichment programs will sustain combat readiness in mental health levels of single parents and the important role of military psychologists. The last contribution is the specific role of military psychology in combat. And Kewu made an important contribution with his research on impact of psychological well-being and perceived combat readiness on soldiers' willingness to deploy in the SNF. This is a first of its kind research in Africa. We unpack combat readiness and willingness to deploy on different dimensions like the role of family support again, intra-psychic confidence of soldiers, esprit de corps, cohesion and discipline of the unit. And can we adjust the combat readiness and willingness to deploy questionnaires for the study to be applied in broader Africa? We contextualize psychological well-being for the African continent with meaningful results. The results show that perceived combat readiness makes a stronger contribution to explain willingness to deploy with psychological well-being make a smaller but still a significant contribution. This means for the SNDF and Africa, military psychologists need to play a role during training and preparations of soldiers and psychological well-being for higher levels of willingness to deploy and to fight for their country and the continent. To conclude this part, we illustrated through our contributions and research that military psychology can play a vital role before, during, and after deployments of our soldiers. I want to focus now, ladies and gentlemen, on our international contributions. Culture is evolving in Africa. Ilya Zampofru from Zimbabwe conducted research on factors that contribute to the change in culture. He focused on factors like individualism and collectivism, the well-known well IC factor of Hofstede and Matsumoto, where individualistic culture is more self-centered, self-orientated, more dominant in countries like the UK, Germany, USA, and France. Collectivistic culture is a we culture, group-orientated, community-focused, and more dominant in Africa, India, Japan, Malaysia, and China. And powerful results show that influences of the West contribute to culture change in Zimbabwe and that there are indications the youth develops a more individualistic culture. I attended a workshop of Professor Alfred Pritz from Austria, Vienna. He is the chair of the World Council of Psychotherapy in Yehunde, Cameroon 2000. With a group of honors and master's students, I observed, ladies and gentlemen, a split ego experience in some of the students with conflicts to move from a collective family to a more individualistic identity as mobilized by the experiences in psychology. This sensitized me for the experiences of our own students. In this regard, the Koch and Van Dijk conducted research with such focus on a sample of our students. The results indicate that the I and the C is not rigid factors rigid cultural orientations, but more 
ends in different, but move and change in different situations. Secondly, the African students generally move more to the individualistic orientation. Very interesting, but the white students move more to a collective orientation. This is beneficial for the transformation in the SNF because culturally they generally moved closer to each other. At the same conference in Yahunde, Pritz challenged us to develop an African orientated psychotherapeutic modus. Professor Matuhani from INISA and myself grab the challenge and we are the founders of Ubuntu therapy. We studied and used the African philosophy of John Mabiti in 1969, a philosopher who moved between Uganda and Kenya in the 1960s. The focus of Ubuntu is humanity and weeness, collectiveness, and rooted in the Creator. He views Ubuntu as follow, respect for any human being, respect for human dignity in human life, and collective sharedness, obedience, solidarity, caring, interdependence, and communalism. We use the existential worth and positive energy in the Ubuntu approach to heal African families on a psychotheological level, on an intra-relationship intra level, and an inter-relationship level. We help people with the mismatch syndrome moving from collectivistic to individualistic approach, people who suffer as apartheid victims, and families who struggle with HIV AIDS. As long as Ubuntu has meaningful members, it can contribute to healing in their lives. The second international contribution we develop, the first holistic approach in military psychology in the world to manage and treat trauma. Africa is a continent that has been subjected to severe trauma. Research indicates 40% of the world's conflict occurs in Africa. In the past, it was in countries like Zimbabwe, South Africa, Mozambique, Namibia, Uganda, and Angola, and currently DRC, SAR, the Sudan, Somalia, Libya, Egypt, and Nigeria. It is imperative that soldiers receive proper trauma management and treatment from military psychologists to keep them combat ready. In the past, trauma effects in soldiers have only been treated partially, primarily as at a conscious level with only talk treatment. We develop a holistic approach to trauma management and treatment and and it exists with the following dimensions. The conscious dimension is still use psychological debriefing as soon as possible during operations to prevent PTSD. The personal subconscious dimension, meaning to use the theory of Carl Gustav Jung to finish the unfinished traumatic content in the subconscious mind of soldiers after they experience symptoms, already experience symptoms of PTSD by using hypnosis. The body dimension refers to the neurological process that occurs in the brain of a soldier when his senses observe danger such as the enemy can also be a snake. During this traumatic event, the brain releases chemicals like adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, and opiates. These chemical, chemicals cause topical and muscular changes in the body. The body re reacts with fight, flight, fight, and freeze reactions. These chemical reactions caused by fight, flight, and freeze responses remain in the body as muscle construction, as indicated by Scherer, a neurologist. Trauma exists in the nervous system of the body of a soldier, said Peter Levine. To release this body trauma, David Bacelli developed the trauma tension trauma releasing exercises to activate, ladies and gentlemen, not talk, just to activate the back brain of the soldier to release the stored trauma to tremoring of their bodies. 
Post-traumatic growth is the last dimension in trauma management treatment to use the effect of trauma event for personal growth in a soldier on a religious, personal, social, and relationship level to become a stronger and more enriched person of future, for future operations. The nature of war is changing in the world from conventional war to peacekeeping operations to near wars, ladies and gentlemen. And near wars arrived in Africa. This demands a change in leadership from the parade ground approach to leadership from the edge for Africa to stop Boko Haram, Al Shabaab, Seleka fighters with ISIL as advisors for some of them. When General McChrystal of the United States arrived in Iraq during the last war against ISIS, after a couple of weeks and several losses, he was confronted by the fact that his leadership style and military, pouch, military approach was not winning near wars. He withdrew for six months to the background to rethink their leadership style and military doctrine. Important for us, combat readiness is needed to stop these near wars in Africa. Calder described near wars as wars and battles taking place in areas where the disintegration of one or more states is reality, like in the past now with Iraq. Rebecca Johnson referred to this as irregular warfare and explained that some members who have no military training, some fighters do not wear uniforms, they operate outside the Geneva Convention and humanitarian law and law of armed conflict, and many are involved in killings, looting, raping, and other criminal activities. Even Barlow explained these groupings have already gained foothold in the North, West, East, Central Africa. And they are moving southward. These near wars will force leaders from the edge in South Africa to make a junior level complex tactical judgments and decisions with military, cultural, political, personal, and legal ramifications. We need a training philosophy for junior leaders and soldiers which demands a culture and military change in mindset to align military education and training of soldiers to develop military leaders from the edge. This faculty did research on the profile of soldiers for near wars, align the process to develop leaders from the edge and give a proposal to focus in their training and education. We need to change our military mindset now if we want to outthink them when they arrive with their land cruisers. We were in a privileged position to launch our textbook, Military Psychology for Africa, in March 2016. As the local newspaper, the West London, described it, it is the first of its kind. In the process, we used only academics from Africa. Several of the authors are specialists developed by this faculty. We received two high-profile academic reviewed feedbacks in accredited journals. Overall, with positive feedback, and from the negative feedback, we learned for the next copy. The book was distributed in 15 countries. Our last international contribution, the Serbian military received permission from Sun Media to translate Military Psychology for Africa for the Balkan countries with a new title. A second book will be launched November 2018 at the first international scientific conference in Belgrade, Serbia, titled Stress in the military profession, achievement, and perspectives. From our contribution, ladies and gentlemen, as external reviewer of chapters and contribution of a chapter in the new book, as well as the translated book, 
they requested Stellenbosch University to be the co-author of their conference proceedings. I'm in a process to finish. First, the nature of war is changing. Military psychologists need to analyze the challenges and characteristics of near wars, translate the results to job fit profiles of soldiers, and bring into play factors like emotional, cultural, and electronic intelligence. Develop more leaders from the edge, transform training doctrine in organizational culture. We must not arrive outdated like General McChrystal. Secondly, military psychologists need to take the lead in the research on combat readiness and gender in South Africa and Africa. Thirdly, military psychologists need to enforce a holistic framework approach to manage and treat trauma. With our compartment approach, our soldiers may end up with unfinished PTSD business. Fourthly, there is a great need in South Africa and Africa for a center for military psychology, military ethics, military leadership research, short courses, postgraduate material, and academic publications. Lastly, in 2016, I was invited to do a presentation on the role of military psychology in Africa at the African Peace Support Trainers Association, UPSTA in Egypt, which mobilized an invitation to the AU on the same focus. Logistical obstacles prevented this important opportunity. This faculty and university with the support of the SNDF, need to become more involved in UPSTA and AU on the research, contribution, and at advisory level. Possibly, our involvement in the Africa Standby Force can also be a good beginning. I want to conclude. Military psychology, as illustrated, is relevant in the military in Africa. Military psychology can play a vital role before, during, and after operations. Military psychology has already made some relevant national and international contributions. There are strategic future challenges to develop not only warriors, but ladies and gentlemen, wise warriors to outthink the enemy and to win wars. I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Van Dijk. Let us give him another round of applause, please. Thank you again for highlighting the significant impact of military psychology and its relevance within the military context. In fact, if I'm to say, stay, uh, state uh, a quote from uh, one of uh, the well-known figures in science, uh, Einstein, when he said that any fool can know, the key is to understand. So now most of us understand what military psychology is all about. You took us through a journey of the origin and development of military psychology. Interesting enough, it originated under conventional war conditions in the First World War, 1917, when the United States actually entered the, Se the First World War. And it grew and deepened in the Second World War, 1939 to 1945, and it grew even further than that. The very same principles still apply the scope of military psychology seems like it has now increased, now to include non-conventional war, war 
in the 21st century. It's still applicable and the field is still growing. And thank you very much for sharing those thoughts. Another highlight is that now, in history, we have known that in Africa, war was a family affair. In many countries, including Ethiopia, during military campaigns, soldiers went to war with their wives and sisters for logistical purposes and also for moral support, if you know what I mean. <laughs> right. Today, it's still the case. Military operations, also participating in peacekeeping operations, is still, it's a still military, uh, family affair because families must support the soldiers. Families must still support uh, soldiers who are going to deploy in various, in, uh, in various areas away from their homes. It's still a family affair in the 21st century. Thank you for highlighting that aspect. And there are very in, uh, interesting aspects that you've also highlighted. That you know, military psychology, its value not, is not only in terms of pre, uh, protecting the mental health of, their soldiers, of the soldiers, but it's more than, more than that. It affects every aspect of the soldier's life, both in deployment, both in, uh, uh, in operations, and also its value in assisting the development of strategic leadership, which currently uh, seems to be an issue that we are grappling with. Also, thank you very much for that. Okay, these were my highlights. Now I'm done. I, I got nothing else left. <laughs> right. right. Now I'm going to call upon, upon uh, Professor Eugene Clute to the stage, please. Welcome. Uh, can I call uh, Professor McGinley to the stage, please? Thank you very much. Let's release them to take their seats. I would now like to call upon the Dean of the Faculty of Military Science, Professor Sam Tesla. We also give him a round of applause <laughs> for coming to the stage <laughs> and shake his hand. Now I'll call upon Professor Kilfan Day to the stage. Thank you very much. Let's give them some time to also take their <laughs> Right. Uh, I think the one last thing that I, there are certain ways that Professor Van Dijk, they said we must avoid to mention when we are busy, but we are next to the psychologist. Don't use the way it, it's crazy or this is a madhouse. The psychologists take offense to that. When it's very busy, just say it's busy. Don't use these other two words. Uh, thank you very much. Now, um, the proceedings will be as follows. You're going to rise to allow the academic procession to leave the, uh, to leave the venue, and thereafter, there are refreshments, and I believe there's full meal uh, at the Military Academy Combined Lab we can all move there and enjoy our, meal, um, our meals. And uh, as I indicated before, the bar is also available and emphasis on the cash part 
of the bar. <laughs> right. uh, let us rise and allow the, uh, the, the academic procession to leave the stage. <laughs>